And so we've got to ask ourselves, you know, why are we eating this way? You know? Why do we have this ecosystem? Why haven't we questioned something 10,000 years old that clearly was not developed for sustainability? There's no magic plant that can withstand everything, but the perennial habit has much greater flexibility in the, ch in the face of a, of a turbulent and unpredictable climate. Well, perennial crops differ from annual crops in that they regrow every year and thus prevent the soil from being exposed on an annual basis to the elements, rainfall in particular, but also wind. And by protecting the soil with living vegetation year after year, you prevent soil erosion, which is critical. And you also prevent nutrient loss, uh, nutrient leakage, which causes all sorts of problems in aquatic ecosystems, including dead zones in marine ecosystems. Um, and then uh, perennial cover also inhibits weeds from invading. And, you know, we as humans have spent a lot of our last 10,000 years weeding. <laughs> it's probably our number one occupation, honestly, in the last 10,000 years. We don't think about it right now, but in traditional agriculture, it is what people spend most of the time doing, that and clearing land for agriculture. If you were a Neolithic farmer 10,000 years ago and you were starting agriculture, you would choose plants that held their seed at the end of the year and re-sow them the next year. And this process of collecting and re-sowing on an annual basis developed annual crops rather quickly. And if you were to try to do that with perennials, well, for one, you don't need to re-sow the, the plant to have a crop the next year, and, and those people would have known that. Um, the plant regrows itself. So even the initiative to, or, or the, the drive to collect seed and re-sow it was not there to begin with. The agriculture we've developed is the epitome of simplicity, I think, and, and I would much prefer us moving towards a level of complexity that we can't entirely control mm. and it's not always going to give us exactly what we're hoping for mm. but in terms of its sustainability mm. and and its role on the planet um it would be far superior mm. it's one thing to perennialize what we're already accustomed to eating and and that's obviously important because we don't tend to change very quickly our habits especially around eating um, but the the array of plants that are out there to to adapt and provide nutrition and ecosystem functions goes so far beyond what we're accustomed to and now that we understand more about how plants work and how they can be selected for in a relatively rapid way I just think it's incredibly exciting to, to imagine a very adapted, robust, resilient agriculture suited for specific parts of the planet that were developed in those regions um, over the next uh, 50 years. It's totally possible. So getting that going, getting those research clusters off, uh, off and running would be, you know, that's exactly what we'd like to see happen and what we're trying to facilitate at this point. You're right, that right now, at least in, in the uh, industrialized world, most of our agricultural landscapes feature monocultures or single species cropping systems. And those are there partly because they're easy to harvest with a machine. Mm. They all mature at the same time, you manage them the same way, and it, it's a very simplified ecosystem that lends itself to an industrial 
uh, uh, you know, uh, harvesting and planting and, and, and maintenance in general. Mm. Um, what we're envisioning is a mixture of species that delivers higher ecological efficiency in pest and disease control, in resource use efficiency. I mean, two plants that are identical compete with each other the most because they have exactly the same requirements. If you have two different species, then one may get their its water a little bit deeper, one may a little more shallower, one may prefer this kind of nutrient in, this, in these ratios. And so different species tend to compete less with each other. And sometimes, such as a legume, they might contribute something the other plant needs like nitrogen. Um, so we envision deploying a mixture of species and it will be a little bit more complicated to harvest but that's not that's not going to stop us. I mean actually harvesting technologies is the least of our worries if we're having to reap two kinds of seeds either at once or split over the course of the season. But it is, a, it is a very different vision than, than what we've become used to. One of our approaches at the Land Institute that's really taken off this year is to not simply focus on, uh, on us doing the work, but rather to generate a hub of, of perennial agriculture work that extends all around the planet. And um, we've been leading up to this, but we're starting to do it more consciously. So reaching out to, to develop collaborations with groups such as here in Sweden, this, this visit I've made right here, um, there's definitely a research cluster in perennial agriculture focusing on, on sociology, ecology, and plant breeding in different parts of Sweden right now. And we're very excited at this as being a model of something that we'd like to see happen in many other parts of the world. I would wish for our species to be genuinely satisfied living within limits. It, that For it not to be some kind of, uh, you know, um, second-rate livelihood, but actually a first-rate livelihood, that that would be uh, the right thing to do and, and life would be as joyful and gratifying as we seem to experience pushing every limit. Um, it's, it's a linchpin. I don't know.